My name is Sai Venom, and I'm a developer advocate with IBM. And I'm excited to be here today at Containers Conference 2018. I'm really happy that you guys have chosen me to come here, and uh, I'm happy to have the opportunity to sp uh, speak to you today about some of the cool things that IBM is doing in the container space, but also about some really cool open source tech that's out there. Just really quickly, show of hands, I want to know how many people here are from Bengaluru, are from this area? Wow, that's amazing. OK, so usually how it usually goes, so just like the other uh, month, about a few months ago, I was in Copenhagen. So I, do, I did a lot of conferences this year. So I was in New York City, San Francisco, and I asked the same question. And what people generally end up saying is that like, it's, it's somewhere around a tenth of the people are from the actual city that I'm speaking at. So it's actually really awesome to be here in Bengaluru, where almost everyone here is from this community. So I know that when we have interesting conversations later today, I know that I'll be working with local community developers, which is awesome. I'm actually flying here from Austin, Texas, to be able to speak to you today. Uh, so that's almost exactly on the other side of the world. It's something like a 12-hour difference. You don't want to know about how long the flight was. OK, I'll tell you. It was 28 hours. It was rough. But I made it here, and I'm excited to be speaking with you all today. Um, IBM is a sponsor of Containers Conference. The thing is, we love the containers community, so much so that we're, we're here, we're at the events, we're speaking to customers, users, and not necessarily so that, you, that you'll use our offering, but just because we want to help the community. And actually, a large part of my day-to-day -day kind of responsibilities is to work with our existing clients and show them, hey, Although IBM has this cool old mainframe stuff, monolithic, old school Java type things, what we really want is for everyone to move to the new age of development, cloud native development, containers, Kubernetes, clusters. We want everyone to be there one day. So you might look at my first slide and be scared. This is not a threat. I'm not threatening you guys. I'm essentially, this is, this is the pattern that we've been noticing in the ecosystem. Either you evolve or you fall behind. And this isn't just specific to containers or programming languages or application development. Let me start with an example. Let's flash back to 2007. And I won't call out the, the consumer brand here, but you'll remember back then that there was a certain brand that had every consumer's attention. So from things like gaming consoles, a Walkman in everyone's pocket, right? Camcorders, photos, cell phones, portable televisions. There was one company that pretty much every single person would go to to buy a high-end electronic. Does anyone remember what else was invented, or rather, uh, created in 2007? iPhone, yeah, exactly. The iPhone was able to take all of those utilities, right? Everything from the Walkman to, to GPS, videos, um, cell phones, right? Every single thing that we see here it was able to pack it into a single device. Apple was able to disrupt the ecosystem, create a new technology, smartphones, and did it in such a way that it forced other companies to adapt. And, and evolve to keep up. And the, for the companies that didn't, they fell behind. As an example, I think we all maybe had Nokia phones back then. They were awesome, they were great, they were bricks, they would last anything. But these days, almost no one has a Nokia smartphone. So moral of the story is, you evolve or you fall behind. So this ecosystem that we have here specifically I'd like to say it started about five years ago. And that came around with Docker and containerization technology. And, and the, great, the great part of that is this community is, is very different from, from what has evolved over the years. This, conta uh, this container-based ecosystem is so based in open source. It's got all these great people developing and creating tools. And I don't actually expect you to read any of these, but just to call a few things out in here, we see things like Envoy, Linkerd, Containerd, 
Uh, we see cloud platforms like AWS and IBM Cloud. Uh, we see Kubernetes, obviously, but we also see Mesos. There's a lot of things in the ecosystem, right? By the way, this slide is pulled from CNCF, uh, which is the Cloud Native Computing Foundation.io. And uh, they're a great website. It's an open foundation. And they're basically pulling together all of the great open source tools that have been developed, um, at, whether they're by, contributed by companies or, or whether they're developed by the community itself. But the fact is, there's a lot of things in this space. So when you think about it, one of them has stood out amongst all the others. And that one, as you may guess, is Kubernetes. And it's not necessar necessarily that Kubernetes is uh, kind of drowning out all of the other solutions. It's that Kubernetes has created a community for other people to come in and create open source technologies and solutions. So much so that just a screen grab from the talks today, almost all of these talks touch Kubernetes in one way or another. I wouldn't be remiss to call this a Kubernetes conference. Yes, it's a containers conference, but the fact is Kubernetes is the top, uh, top dog right now. So more audience participation. I know this is hard, but everyone raise your hands because the first question I'm going to ask is who's heard of Kubernetes? So if everyone, go ahead and raise your hands. OK, so my next question, keep your hands raised, guys. Keep your hands raised. My next question is going to be how many of you have worked with Kubernetes? OK. Awesome. And my next question is, how many of you have actually worked with Kubernetes in production, a running production application? So even fewer. So I have the great opportunity of being the first ones to speak to you today. So I get the chance to introduce you guys for, it seems like a lot of you haven't worked with Kubernetes before, and especially not in production. I get to be the one that introduces you to key Kubernetes concepts. But before I jump into that, let's talk about where Kubernetes came from, where the, the container technology basically came from in the first place. Cloud and native application development isn't a new concept. It's been around for a while. With virtual servers like VMware and bare metal being available 10, maybe even more, 10 plus, 10 plus years ago, uh, just a cloud that would spin up bare metal or VMs for you and allow you to get access. They were good. They were powerful. You didn't have to worry about on-prem uh, containers or anything like that. But you had to have a really smart operations team or a really smart operations guy. But the fact is, it was a lot of overhead. You get all the performance and control you could ever want, right? You get access to the machines themselves. But it's not easy. So in like the last five years, a new thing started arising. That's uh, developer-oriented platforms. So things like platform as a service where developers could come in, write a uh, few lines of code, or you know, write a whole application, deploy it, and the platform takes care of everything. That was like a dream come true almost. All, uh, all of the clouds, IBM did it, Azure did it, Google did it. We were all like, hey, developers, you no longer have to worry about infrastructure, just write code. Right? Well, that wasn't necessarily the case. There was a lot of problems that started coming up. And I could go through all of them right now, but maybe I'll hit one of them. Network latency was a huge issue that, for some reason, no one seemed to have foreseen it with, with uh, uh, PaaS environments like Cloud Foundry and um, Heroku and that kind of thing. Basically, when you develop tons of microservices, scale them out in those kinds of environments, those network hops and managing like tracing and logging between all of those was incredibly difficult. It was a problem that couldn't be solved, or so we thought. About five years ago, Docker was created, and then uh, container orchestration tools started to get developed. And here, right smack dab in the middle, we get a perfect balance of performance and control and speed with Kubernetes. Yeah, it's not going to be as fast as if you're working with serverless or Cloud Foundry. And maybe you don't get as much control over the machines themselves. But the fact is, containers give you the right amount of control while allowing your developers to stay productive. Let's talk about a few use cases for containers. I'm guessing most of you kind of know these, but um, on one end of the spectrum, you know, cloud native is this perfect, ideal way of developing applications. But the truth is, not everyone is able to start from scratch. 
Say your boss comes to you and says, hey, Sai, we need a mobile application. For some reason, it doesn't have to use any of our legacy systems. You can start from scratch, use a database in the cloud, use applications in the cloud, do whatever you want. That's like a dream come true for a development team, right? Well, yeah, that's great. And, and a lot of people uh, will, would, would love to use Kubernetes for something like that. But the fact is, nine, nine times out of 10, and probably more like 99 times out of 100, it's going to be a story of modernizing legacy apps. People in this room, you're probably enterprise application developers, right? A lot of you are. Um, and essentially what that means is you're working with legacy systems and apps, and the problem is you need to be able to modernize those onto these clusters, onto Kubernetes, and, and before Kubernetes and clusters, this was a hard task. Well, with Kubernetes, this, this is becoming more of a possibility, and uh, it's definitely a very solid use case uh, for using containers and clusters and Kubernetes. So let's go over some of the Kubernetes capabilities. Again, like I said, I get to be the first one to talk to you about it. So as a lot of you, well, some of you uh, haven't even uh, played with Kubernetes before, so I think this is a great exercise for us to quickly talk about what's possible. Don't worry, I won't bore you too much with the slides. First off the bat, we've got intelligence, cap uh, excuse me, intelligence scheduling. So essentially, this is the ability uh, for apps, containers, or pods, as you call it in the uh, Kubernetes uh, kind of land, to be automatically uh, taking advantage of the resources that are available. So any Kubernetes cluster starts with worker nodes, right? So worker nodes are essentially VMs. So you know, going back to our, uh, going back to our roots, it's VMs at the end of the day. So Kubernetes is gonna be installed among a cluster a grouping of VMs, and those resources need to be used in an effective manner. And the first most important capability of Kubernetes is the fact that it intelligently allows you to take advantage of those resources. Self-healing. Applications fail, applications crash. That's nothing new. Kubernetes allows you to automatically spin up containers and go back to the desired state, all by setting a few YAML commands, setting a few parameters that say, hey, you always want X number of these applications running. If one of those crashes, Kubernetes will make sure that it spins up another one. Horizontal scaling, this is one that most people know about. Load hits your application, Kubernetes will scale it out in response to the load and you can also do manual scaling as well. Service discovery and load balancing. This is one that not only makes the developers' lives easier, because obviously, by having easy microservice discovery, you know, so developers are writing different pieces of an application, for them to be able to find each other in an easy manner, in a consistent manner, that's something that Kubernetes allows, and load balancing between them is provided for you. No more messing around with Nginx load balancers, just write your apps, Decide how many, uh, decide how many uh, instances of it you want to be running. Hit the deploy button. Everything is managed for you. Automated rollouts and rollbacks. This is something that in the past an ops team would have to write maybe a long Jenkins job or, or Travis or you know, your favorite CI tool uh, would have to write this massive script out you know, which eventually becomes impossible to maintain. Right? So there's this one guy whose job is just to maintain the, the deployment scripts. Well, now that's also managed by Kubernetes for you because rolling out applications and updates is managed. And finally, secret and config management. Just wanted to throw this up there because you know, it, it is important and Kubernetes manages it in a very good manner. So we get these six major capabilities uh, that the Kubernetes, I would say these are the six major reasons why Kubernetes is kind of changing the, uh, the space. So we've talked about Kubernetes as kind of like that core of all the open source tech that we kind of depicted in that slide earlier with all the different little pieces. Let's talk about some community-driven projects. Just last week, or maybe it's a couple weeks now, Google announced Knative. Have you guys heard about Knative? Knative is this uh, really cool open source um, project that was announced by Google but you know, uh, the, the work that went behind it was done by a number of companies. Namely, the huge part about uh, K 
Knative, the biggest component is Istio. And Istio was an open source project developed jointly by IBM, Lyft, and Google. It was contributed to the open source. And rather than talking about it now, I'm going to actually demo it for you uh, in a little bit here. But let's put that on the side burner. The other capability that comes with Knative is the ability to run serverless workloads in Kubernetes. So if you guys aren't familiar with serverless, it's essentially the ability to run code as needed. So spin up a node, run that code, do this logic, and then brings that node back down. I kind of try to compare it to like owning a car versus Uber, whereas Uber is kind of that thing where you only take when you need it, so you're only paying it when you, when you ride an Uber. But owning a car is kind of like you're always paying for the payments, maybe insurance, gas, even when you're not driving it. Say you're out of town, you're still owning and paying for that car. So in case you didn't know, IBM actually has a, one of the leading serverless platforms out there. And it's actually completely open source. So we developed it, and uh, we took it, and we contributed it con completely to the open source. Um, there's, a fo uh, there's a developer advocate, someone much like me at uh, Google, but much, much, much more famous. I think he has like 50,000 uh, followers on, on, um, on Twitter or something like that. But you guys might uh, recognize the name. It's Kelsey Hightower. Uh, he's a pretty popular dev advocate from Google. Actually gave us a shout out about uh, our serverless platform, essentially saying from new account to running code in five minutes, IBM Cloud Functions passes the test. IBM Cloud Functions are backed by OpenWhisk, taking an open source project and turning it into a product. Kelsey goes on uh, with a lot of praise about the platform, um, but just wanted to put that in there. Um, but here's how we see OpenWhisk working with Knative. Knative is still relatively new. So this is kind of still experimental and basically what we can expect to see in the future. But what we're going to see, so Knative gives us the native capabilities for serverless, right? So things like auto scaling, routing, Here's the main one, code to container conversion. The ability to take code, put it into a container, spin it up, run that code, pull that container back down. Essentially taking the thing that all these serverless platforms had, Amazon, Google, Microsoft, IBM. There's a big problem with those, it caused vendor lock-in, right? You'd be stuck with one vendor. Knative is uh, gonna solve that problem by allowing you to use serverless in a vendor neutral way. OpenWhisk would sit on top of the Knative serverless infrastructure and abstract away those difficulties, allowing developers to have the tools and uh, capabilities to actually write those serverless actions. And of course, we've got that all sitting on IBM's Cloud Kubernetes service. Some more community-driven projects. We've got ContainerD. I think that was, had a big presence uh, at a Container Conference last year. Essentially, it's Docker, but in the context of Kubernetes, it's much more lightweight. And uh, essentially, it, it, it gets you uh, the ability to run smaller workloads or certain workloads in a more efficient manner. This one right here is Prometheus. I put this one here because I'll, it'll be part of the demo that I'll be showing you uh, in a little bit here. Kind of a rhetorical question, right? Which would you prefer? You don't have to answer that. The fact is, on the left side here, this is what it looks like to the average developer when they see Docker, Kubernetes, Prometheus, Jaeger, Istio, um, and the list goes on and on and on. All of these crazy capabilities that the community has developed to solve specific problems, but how do you know which ones to pick? How do you know which ones to choose? It's, 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 it's impossible, and you need to be an expert to be able to put all of those things together and have it work the right way. Well, luckily, there's folks at IBM that have done exactly that and have taken solutions like Kubernetes and Docker and all of those open source projects and have figured out the best way to put those together. We've created samples and code patterns and most, most namely, the IBM Cloud Kubernetes service which is a managed Kubernetes offering that's made available to you um, to, to spin up Kubernetes clusters with ease. So yeah, I think I'll go with the Bugatti 
uh, rather than building my own car. And with that, I want to jump into a demo. So I'm going to go ahead and pray to the demo gods here. I'm running on my hotspot. So wish me luck. Going to do all of this live. So what we see here is the IBM Cloud dashboard. The IBM Cloud dashboard allows you to do a few things, but namely, it allows you to manage your clusters in an easy, GUI fashion. So the first thing I would do is go to Create Cluster. I have four bars. It should be good. A few seconds, this will load. And you can choose a region. So we've got everywhere from Germany, Sydney, Tokyo, UK, and then two in US. You can create a cluster. Within, a, within minutes, by, by choosing this option to create a cluster, you'll have a cluster that you can start accessing right away. And IBM isn't doing anything fancy here. It's, it's essentially spinning up worker nodes in the geographies that you choose, giving you the RAM, the GPUs, if you, if you want GPUs, you know, if you're doing like machine learning or that kind of thing. Uh, it'll do that kind of thing. Um, it'll install Kubernetes on them, and then it'll expose configuration for you to access that cluster in a secure fashion. This isn't anything new. This is the same thing that kind of like AWS would do. Uh, this is the same thing that the G uh, Google Cloud, you know, Azure, the managed Kubernetes offerings. Uh, IBM, I think, has a pretty slick one uh, where, where you can kind of just go ahead and do it. But I've gone ahead and created that cluster ahead of time. And now I want to show you how to actually access that cluster. So first thing I'm going to do is run the BXCS so actually, let me go ahead and do it this way. So I'll do IBM Cloud. So that's the CLI tool. CS for container service. Cluster config. I wanted to pull that config. And then the name of my cluster is my cluster. Here, let's do it this way. I think I messed up my aliases, so we'll use BX instead. OK, so essentially what this is going to do now is go and talk to my IBM Cloud instance and pull my cluster's config information. This takes a little bit. I've noticed that uh, this command takes a little bit longer when running in India, uh, probably because my cluster is in Texas. Makes sense, huh? So it says, tells me to export this config command. I'll go ahead and export it. And that's it. No longer do I have to mess with any IBM tools or even I don't even really need to go to the, the, the cloud dashboard anymore. I can now effectively use kubectl. If you guys are familiar with it, it's the Kubernetes, you know, the open source way of working with your Kubernetes cluster. I can use kubectl to actually access this cluster. Very simply, let's start with the kubectl get pods. Pods are groups of Docker containers. It's essentially the smallest logical unit uh, in Docker that can be scaled. And I've got a bunch of pods already deployed here. Deployed them this morning. You can see uh, it's been running for about five hours. Yeah, I woke up pretty early today. Jet lag. Um, so we can see that there's a few applications running. On the top, we have Avatar. Avatar is a simple microservice that just generates a little image when you uh, call it. I've got Guestbook v1. We see that there's two copies of it. And Guestbook v2, two copies of it. Highly available, OK. And then we've got Redis master and two Redis slave nodes. So Redis is a data store. The application that I want to show you today is a guestbook app. I wrote it kind of over the course of a weekend. It's, not, it's nothing fancy, but here's what it looks like. And actually, I meant to reset this environment. But you know what? We'll just go ahead. Uh, so here's what the guestbook application looks like. And you can do things like, hello, Containers Conference 2018. And we'll put my name in here. Hit Submit. In a few seconds, it'll post it to the Redis database. And actually, if you guys wanted to, you could hit 50.23.5.160, colon 313080 uh, on your cell phones. And it would, you would be able to hit this application as well. And uh, just don't put anything mean in there. Just promise me that. Uh, but anyway, so we can see that we have this running Kubernetes application in our cluster. But I wanted 
so we talked about Kubernetes, we talked about IBM Kubernetes service, but let's talk about some of the cool open source capabilities that I keep mentioning, keep talking about. Let's talk about Istio. So just really quickly, Istio is a thing that needs to be installed into your cluster. To prove that it's installed to my cluster, generally I can do something like kubectl get pods dash n istio dash system. This is getting all the pods in the istio system namespace in my Kubernetes instance. Okay, awesome. We can see all of the Istio components are running. Interestingly, we see things like Prometheus, Service Graph. At the top, we see Grafana. Let me see if I can make this a little bit bigger. Okay, so you guys can see the full uh, thing. So Istio is installed, it's running, and it's managing my Kubernetes applications. The first thing I wanna show you is traffic management. So I'll run the Istio CTL. Actually, first let me show you what's in this folder. I've got a couple of YAML files, which is essentially gonna let me test some traffic management rules with Istio. Let's start with the virtual service all dash v1 one. So the Istio CTL replace dash f file. And I'll pass in all dash v1. And just so you can see what's in that actual file, I won't go into too, too much in depth here. Essentially what it's saying is, route all traffic to guestbook version one. Let's do a refresh and see what happens. Oh wow, a lot of people put uh, entries in there, awesome. Um, I refreshed the app, you'll notice a couple things changed. The avatars disappeared. At the bottom, you can no longer put your username in, and the V2 thing disappeared. So this is the old version of guestbook before we implemented the avatar microservice. Let's show off Canary Deployments. Canary Deployments is a way for, uh, is, Canary Deployments are a way to essentially deploy different sets of an application, different versions of an application to a different user based on some set of rules. Now the rule can be something random, like oh, 20% of users get version two, 80% get version one. Now why is that important? Imagine you're testing out an experimental feature. Um, I don't know how big Snapchat is here, but Snapchat is a, is a huge follower of this kind of approach. Actually, Facebook does the same thing. But anytime they're doing a drastic UI overhaul, they'll roll out the new version to just a few set of users. If they, and then they kind of scope it out. They see how angry they are. Do they like it? Do they not like it? And if they end up liking it, then they'll roll it out to more users. If they don't like it, if there's a lot of bugs, they'll, they'll probably roll it back fix the bugs, and then again, do an incremental rollout. Let's see a simple version of a Canary deployment here today. So right now, all of the uh, traffic getting hit by the application goes to the V1 app, right? Let's say that if you're using Firefox, you'll hit the V2 version of the app. And just to show you, I pulled up Chrome here, and I'm gonna hit the app, and again, as you can see in the top, it's the V1 version. Cool stuff. So let's do Istio CTL replace. So Istio CTL is very similar to kubectl. Uh, it's the Istio command line tool. Hence Istio cuddle. Uh, Istio CTL replace. And then this time, I wanna pass in the, not the 80-20 rule, but the test rule. I'll run that. And just to, again, show you guys what's in that actual YAML file. We can see that there's a match here. If the user agent matches Firefox, route them to v2. Otherwise, route them to v1. There's some more interesting stuff you can do here too. This is pretty basic. And in reality, you would probably never kind of use a rule like this. You would probably have something like um, user agents from a mobile browser get a different version of the application than, uh, than traditional browsers, right? That could be one example. But you can also do in interesting intelligent manipulation here, things like checking cookies, uh, or just doing you know, dumb 80, 20, 70, 30 kind of like weighted rules. So let's go ahead, since I've already applied that rule, let's test it. Refreshing Chrome, okay, still V1, that's what I expected. Let's refresh Firefox. V2. There you go. And you can see the avatars. 
So essentially, using Istio, we were able to do traffic management, routing traffic intelligently, intelligently in quotes, to different versions of the running application. Cool stuff, right? I know, it's cool. OK, so we talked about the traffic management capabilities with Istio, but still haven't tr touched some of that other cool open source stuff that Istio comes with, things that I mentioned like Prometheus, right? Let's take a look at that. So built in with Istio, so just by installing Istio, you get rich insight into your running Kubernetes cluster. Imagine that uh, right now something in the cluster goes wrong. It would be really hard for us to kind of dig in and figure out where things went wrong, uh, figure out uh, logs, tracing. It's messy, right? Of course, you could go to the Kubernetes dashboard, hit the logs button, but then you have to decide which version of the app, version one or version two. And then there's two instances of each. So if one of the versions runs into an error, you have to sit there and dig through all the logs. Of course, you could instrument it with a logging mechanism, sure. And then your boss says, okay, now we need tracing. So then you have to instrument tracing. Okay, then, then the boss says you need metrics. And then you need uh, this and that and that. And you can see the rabbit hole gets deeper and deeper and deeper. Istio comes built in with all of those capabilities. Let's take a look at Jaeger. So Jaeger is running inside the cluster. So I'm gonna run the kubectl get service. So this is gonna give us a port number for the tracing service, which is essentially Jaeger in the Istio namespace. We take this port. By the way, you could access this as well. And we hit this. And boom, we get the Jaeger UI. A lot of you have been hitting the app. I was happy that, about that so that we can actually get some real traces here. So let's get the traces from Guestbook. Hit Find Traces. All right. See all those little dots on the right? Uh, they're not showing up too great on the monitor, but all those little dots are you guys hitting this application. This one big one is where a bunch of people hit it at the same time. The latest call took 30 milliseconds, and we can dig into that and see how long each request took, how long the guestbook request took, and really just dig into each portion of those requests. Cool stuff. Let's get even deeper. Let's look at Grafana. So Grafana is a dashboard that allows you to pull in metrics, tracing, uh, uh, and, and other sorts of data and depict it in a nice, beautiful way. So Grafana is already also running in the Istio system, but it's not exposed as a service, so we can't just simply put a port and access it. We've got a port forward from our Kubernetes cluster into our local machine. This is a bit, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not completely sure how effective this will be, because essentially what this is doing is tunneling a cluster from Texas all the way to India. So again, demo gods, please. Let's hope this works. So we're loading up the Grafana dashboard here. And let's take a look at the Istio mesh dashboard. And if you wanted to, you can jump in here and create custom dashboards for whatever you want. That Istio is already streaming in because Prometheus, you know, it's, uh, it's picking up all this data. Istio, or, or rather Grafana, allows you to take that data and create beautiful dashboards. So here we can see the global request volume. We're getting about something like 19 ops per minute, 99.9% .9 success rate. I wanted to see 100%. What's up with that? Oh, yeah. We can see that some requests are failing. OK, so already you can see how valuable it can be to have a dashboard like this I'm guessing that some of the requests that you guys are sending out may be failing, may be timing out, and, and we can see and dive into that directly here in this dashboard. Next, let's take a look at Prometheus. So this is the tool that's actually getting all that data and streaming it to the Grafana dashboard. Maybe it would have made more sense to show that first. Oh, well. So this is one that... Um, I'm pretty hesitant about because Prometheus is one of those things that makes a lot of network calls. Makes a lot of network calls. So we'll do Istio request count. It's a very simple uh, expression. Sorry, hit execute. See if there's any errors here. Usually it tells me, yeah, it's timing out. 
Um, it might still do it though. I had to execute a couple of times. That's fine. We'll try it another time. So essentially this is uh, Prometheus and what it's doing is it's pulling the data from the cluster and streaming it to things like Grafana. Last thing I wanna show, yeah, 31 second time difference between your browser and the server. Yeah, that's, that's never good. All right, so let's run uh, the last one here, which is a service graph. You might, at first impression, think that this is kind of an ugly representation, but I'll explain why it's super useful. Okay, it's forwarding. Here we get a dot viz chart of all the microservices that are running in our cluster, as well as how long it takes for them uh, to uh, call each other, and the requests per second. This is a pretty simple app. I have guestbook version one right here, and guestbook version two right there. Remember I said guestbook version two uses avatar, that little microservice? We can see that guestbook version two has an arrow pointing to avatar, but version one does not. Simple app, but a, a pictorial description of all the, uh, the nodes and pods that are running in the, uh, in the Kubernetes cluster and how they're speaking with one another. Scale this out to 10, 15 microservices, this starts becoming really, really useful to kind of help developers understand how requests are flowing within an application. Okay, that's it for my demo, that's it for, that's it for Istio. Uh, hope that was useful. Let's jump back to the slides. So we talked about IBM Kubernetes service. That's kind of where that application was hosted uh, and all the, all the abilities to actually access that. Uh, it was something that was uh, made available through the Kubernetes service. Uh, I'm running out of time here a little bit, so I'm gonna quickly go through this. So Kubernetes gives you simple cluster management, you know, a graphical UI to spin up clusters. It allows you to define how much RAM you want, how many nodes, if you want GPUs, it's great for machine learning. Container security is a big thing for us. A lot of our customers are health organizations, banks. Security is an utmost requirement here. Ability to extend IBM Cloud Services, so really rich integrations with things like Watson, IoT, capabilities that are just built into our cloud. And the best thing is, it's a native experience. We're not rewriting Kubernetes. We're enabling you to use the latest versions of Kubernetes. We do some vulnerability testing. We make sure that it's completely safe, production ready for you and then we allow you to deploy those uh, services. So, as you can see, a lot of advantages that you get with a managed Kubernetes service. But the thing is, you might be thinking, hey, Sai made this look so easy. I'm gonna go home. I'm gonna start using a managed Kubernetes service. I'm gonna start innovating, writing apps. I'm gonna make my company billions. I'm gonna become the CEO, right? Well, unfortunately, things don't always go as planned because the fact is this is a tumultuous space. There's a lot of new tech always getting in and out of this area and sometimes open source tech doesn't quite work as well as you thought it would. For example, Istio just now made its official GA release, I think sometime in the last week. Before that, it wasn't even uh, kind of recommended for production use. So let's think about this. What's the problem we're trying to solve here, right? And, and I like to think of it as a kind of user persona, Nick, who's an enterprise application developer. So people like me, or at least I was an enterprise app developer for about four years at IBM before I took on this latest role. Um, and, and people like you in the audience who are working on existing legacy systems. One of the major pain points for enterprise app developers is identifying which of these open source tools are good and beneficial for my company? Are they secure? I mean, it's, it's a huge undertaking, right, to understand all of it. But at the end of the day, the fact is, over 80% of developers, like Nick, make the development tool decisions for their companies. So it's people like you that are eventually deciding what tools your companies use. Your manager might come to you and say, hey, uh, we're looking at uh, kind of like Prometheus and Istio, and we're kind of trying to consider if we want to use Istio out of the box, or kind of use um, Datadog's uh, managed offering. We're trying to figure it out. And someone like Nick goes and figures out what the best idea is. So 
we're appealing to folks like Nick. We want people like Nick to have an easy way of understanding all the tools out there and understanding how to actually use them. And with that, I'd like to introduce Will Plusnick, uh, my coworker, my colleague. Uh, please join me in welcoming him. Well, all right, so I don't have a bunch of time left, so I'm going to quickly introduce myself, and then we're going to get right into it. Um, do you want to do the thing? So, okay, yeah, yeah. real quick first. We'd uh, love to put you guys on our Twitter. Yeah. It'd be great if we could get a selfie with you, if you guys could get excited. Uh, we'll take a picture. Would love that. Woo! Containers Comp 2018. Awesome. All right, Thanks, thank guys. you, guys. All right, so I'm Will Plusnick. I've been with IBM for about three years. Um, I'm a developer advocate, and I focus on Kubernetes. I apologize I'm speaking a little quick, but I'm trying not to go over. Um, so I'm going to talk to you today about Call for Code. So Call for Code is a competition, or a challenge, if you will, um, to you, developers. And basically what we're trying to do is we're trying to minimize or mitigate the damage done by natural disasters using technology such as Kubernetes and other cloud technologies as well as AI and several other technology areas. Um, so just some key numbers, 2.5 billion people have been directly affected by natural disasters since 2000, and 1.5 trillion US dollars um, in damage have been done by natural disasters since 2003. So that's just 15 years, it's over a trillion dollars. Um, so kind of the challenge is we need to create a solution that has a significant impact on, the, prepar on the, the preparation for natural disasters, as well as the relief. And we need to consider the fact that their long-term, short-term, mid-crisis, and recovery timeframes are tenable. And we have unprecedented access to computing power, to, to um, data, to advanced statistical techniques. This is something that we believe that, with your help, we can actually solve using these technologies. And so we've partnered or we're a founding partner. Uh, the David Clark cause is actually the, the uh, creator. Um, but we've made strategic partnerships with the American Red Cross, with the United Nations, with the Linux Foundation, and, sev and several other groups um, to help give you guys the tools you need to be able to be successful with this. So the grand prize, so before I start off, basically what you'll be doing is you'll be creating, if you choose to take this challenge, you'll be creating um, you'll be creating technological uh, solutions to help um, bring the, the effect of natural disasters to a lower level than they currently are. Um, and so the first prize will get $200,000, um, a long-term uh, long open source project support from the Linux Foundation, um, a meeting with a venture capitalist to pitch the idea to turn this idea into a company, and we'll be giving you uh, IBM Service Core, which is kind of like the Peace Core, but like through IBM. Uh, we'll be giving you a team to go in and actually implement these solutions in location. Um, so there's also second and third prizes, um, as well as fourth and fifth. Um, but due to time, I'm going to kind of skip over this. Uh, so I recommend taking a picture of this slide if you're interested at all, because this is going to have all of your important URLs. Um, but kind of the first step is to register for the challenge. Then you want to sign up for a free IBM account that will give you access to the free tier of our cloud. Uh, and then you will start with code patterns. So code patterns are, um, oh, as well as there's some communication channels via Slack and via uh, Influitive. Um, so uh, code patterns. So code patterns are there to kind of help you navigate the complexities of Kubernetes. Um, there's a lot of really complex things, and there's a lot of really different models and architectures that you uh, use when you're thinking about building an application in this style than what you might have traditionally used. And so we kind of tried to demystify that by giving you organized, open source uh, solutions that kind of give you like full access to the code, full access to, um, to like architecture diagrams, and just kind of all the resources to kind of help make that leap from traditional development to full Kubernetes development. Um, so like I said, all of these patterns are on GitHub. Uh, you'll actually find it in one of the URLs on that previous slide. I'll go back to it uh, at the end. Um, and so we have several, uh, several code patterns that I just kind of was going to highlight. But due to time, I'm kind of just briefly kind of, I'll read the title and <laughs> move on. 
Um, so deploy distributed GitLab on IBM Kubernetes. So this has multiple, uh, like a multi-tier app. Each component has its own containers and they're talking to each other. A scalable Apache Cassandra. Um, so this uses pods, services, replication controllers, and stateful sets. Uh, WordPress leveraging MySQL with, um, com with uh, Docker Compose, um, or excuse me, with Compose. Uh, Java micro profile for any one familiar with Java. Whoops, I just hit something. Okay. Um, and then an Akka cluster, uh, which is a fault tolerant peer uh, peer to peer cluster membership service. Um, and so this is actually a much more detailed application. Um, we have these and many, many others. Um, again, I apologize, I'm rushing through this a bit. If you have any questions, I'll be out at the, during the break. Um, and so this is kind of just to help you fast track your submission. Well, this is one, to help you learn. But two, this can also be used as a jumping off point for any submissions to call for code. Um, we actually have a chance to do some really good here. Um, and I think that if you guys take up the challenge, we can come up with some really great solutions that will ultimately save lives. So IBM and Kubernetes, we're helping evolve business, we're advancing technology, and with your help, hopefully saving lives. Thank you.